Hi everyone. This video is about understanding Euler's identity. This means not just going through proofs of Euler's identity uh, and the formulas that it's derived from, but we'll take a deeper dive into why these formulas and the functions that compose them behave the way that they do. What is Euler's number? Um, exponential functions are very interesting functions because their derivatives are always proportional to themselves. Um, if you have an exponential function a to the x, the derivative is some constant of proportionality multiplied by a to the x. Uh, when that base is e, then the constant of proportionality is 1 and the derivative of e to the x is in fact itself. Um, I can link a video by 3blue1brown in the description that details this really clearly. Another definition you'll see of E quite often is the equation for continuously compounding a 100% interest rate, and that's the one in the second bullet point. So you have 1 plus 1 over x, where x is the num number of compounding periods, uh, and raised all to the x as your number of compounding periods approaches inf infinity such that you're compounding it continuously then the equation is equal to e. There's two proofs I ran into pretty frequently online when I was researching Euler's identity uh, both showing that e to the i x is equal to cos x plus i sin x uh, this equation then evaluated for x equals pi gives us Euler's identity. Uh, the first proof was a proof by differentiation. And what we do is we consider a function f of x whose numerator is cos x plus i sin x. And the denominator is e to the i x. And remember, we're trying to prove that this numerator and this denominator are equal to each other. We can rewrite the function e to the i x in the denominator as e to the minus i x. And if we take the derivatives, we can use product rule. And this is what the derivative will look like, taking derivative of the first times second plus the derivative of the second times the first. And this is actually all equal to zero. If I multiply the whole equation by i, um, when I distribute it to the first term, I'll multiply it by the e. So I'll have i cos x minus sine x times i e to the minus i x and in the second term I'll multiply it by uh, distributing it into the cos x plus i sin x term so I'll get i cos x minus sin x and now you'll see that the left and the right uh, terms are equal to each other and since we're subtracting them uh, we're subtracting the same thing from itself we get zero so the derivative of f of x is zero uh, this means that our function is a constant. It has no change in magnitude as we change x. And if we evaluate it for x equals 0, we can figure out what that constant is. Uh, e to the 0 is 1. And cos x plus i sin x evaluated at x equals 0 is 1. So 1 divided by 1 is 1. Therefore, our constant is 1, meaning our numerator is equal to the denominator. And we've proven that e to the i x equals cos x plus i sin x. The next proof is the Taylor series expansion of e to the i x. If you're not familiar with the Taylor series, I'll link another 3blue1brown video below that details it really nicely. But essentially, the Taylor series is used to approximate functions um, with a polynomial. Uh, what you do is you make sure that the original function and the approximating function, um, their derivatives initial conditions are equal to each other. So the Taylor series of e to the i x is 1 plus i x plus i x squared over 2 factorial plus i x cubed over 3 factorial and this pattern continues uh, forever. We know from the properties of i, multiplying 1 by i gives i. Multiplying again by i gives negative 1. Multiplying one more time by i 
gives minus i, that was cubing i, and multiplying one more time, raising i to the fourth, gives one again. And that cycle will then continue forever. And so we can rewrite this Taylor series as the second line, shown here. And if we separate the terms with an i uh, from the terms without an i, we can create two separate series. The first series now, you see, that's actually the Taylor series of cosine. And the second series, that's the Taylor series of sine. And so we've proven that e to the i x equals cos x plus i sine x. But even after I learned these proofs, I would still always question in my head how an exponential function e to the i x traces a unit circle in the complex plane. It never really made sense to me, so I'm going to try and give some more intuition onto why that happens next. First, just to wrap it all up, um, let's show that now that we've proven e to the i x equals cos x plus i sine x, we can bring ourselves to the famous Euler's identity equation. We evaluate for x equals pi, e to the i pi equals cos of pi is minus 1, sine of pi is 0. So e to the i pi plus 1 equals 0. The way I like to start to give a lesson on the intuition behind e to the i x is by thinking of the derivative of e to the i x. So uh, through the chain rule, we know we take the derivative of i x, the inner function, and multiply it by the derivative of the outer function. And so we have i times e to the i x. Or in other words, the derivative of e to the i x is e to the i x multiplied by i. And a very unique and interesting property of i is that it rotates numbers 90 degrees to the left in the complex plane. So you think about a point a plus ib being a uh, vector in the complex plane with real magnitude of a and an imaginary magnitude of b. You multiply the whole thing by i. What you get is what was the magnitude in the imaginary direction became the real magnitude after rotation um, multiplied by negative 1. And what was the magnitude in the real direction of the original vector became the magnitude of the imaginary direction. So you have minus b plus ia. And this is the same function that happens when you rotate a number by 90 degrees. Um, your x-coordinate becomes your y-coordinate and your y-coordinate becomes your negative x-coordinate. And you can visualize that here. Um, the purple vector initially in a making an angle theta with the x-axis, uh, once you rotate it 90 degrees to the left, the height of the purple vector becomes the horizontal distance multiplied by minus 1, and the horizontal distance of the original vector becomes the height of the new vector. So let's think about a unit circle as a function of the angle between a vector and the horizontal axis. So we have y being the sine of the angle, and we have x being the cosine of the angle. y prime is cosine of the angle, the derivative of sine theta is cos theta, and x prime is minus sine of the angle, the derivative of cosine of theta is minus sine of theta. Or in other words, your original function where y equals sine theta and x equals cos theta, the derivative of it is y prime equals x and x prime equals minus y. So if you take the derivative of a circle, you get a function that is 90 degrees rotated to the left of the circle. And if you take any instance of the circle, the derivative at said instance will be a 90 degrees rotation of the vector. And here's a nice way to visualize that. You know, the tangent at any point of the circle is a 90 degrees rotation to the left of the vector at said point. 
And so now we've proven that a unit circle, who we know starts at um, magnitude 1 in the real direction, and has a derivative that is constantly equal to a 90 degrees rotation of, the, of itself. And now we have e to the ix, which we know starts at a point of 1 in the real direction when x is 0. And its derivative is always equal to a 90 degrees rotation of itself. And so e to the ix is a unit circle function in the complex plane where we, we are rotating 90 degrees left. Okay, I have some MATLAB code here. And I think it's a really good exercise to understand um, e to the ix and why e to the ix is going to move around a unit circle in the complex plane. So we know the derivative of e to the ix is i e to the ix. And that means that if we want to take an instantaneous derivative uh, for any point x, we just multiply the value by i. Um, I also have a variable for the amount of precision I'm going to use to approximate the function. So I'm going to use a step size that uses the number of steps. Uh, and I'm going to divide 2 pi by the number of steps uh, to be my size of each individual step because there are 2 pi radians to a unit circle. Um, essentially what I'm doing here is a first order Taylor series approximation of the function e to the ix. I take my first order approximation using the initial condition. I know that we're starting at 1 and I know the uh, value of my derivative at this point. And I'm going to use the step size to move my function in the direction of this derivative and then recompute the value of my function at this point and then redo the Taylor series approximation from this new point, from this new initial condition. I'm going to recompute the derivative and then do another small step. And it'll be an iterative process and I will now plot the five different levels of precision that I'm going to be using. So. The first figure here is uh, 20, 20 steps, and as you can see, uh, it's not super fine, so there's going to be quite a bit of error propagation, and yeah, by the end, uh, we're quite off target um, from being a unit circle. But as we move to 50 steps, we get a little closer, uh, still a little too much error. 100 steps, again, same idea we are becoming finer and finer, a more precise approximation. A thousand steps, it's pretty well a unit circle. And 10,000 steps, you can't even see any errors anymore by the time we've traced the entire unit circle. So yeah, it's a nice exercise to visualize how uh, e to the i x is moving for small changes in x. Thank you.